Account of a Vampire We have just had in this part of Hungary a scene of vampirism, which is duly attested by two officers of the tribunal of Belgrade, who went down to the places specified, and by an officer of the emperor's troops at Graditz, who was an ocular witness of the proceedings. In the beginning of September there died in the village of Kifsiloa, three leagues from Graditz, an old man who was sixty-two years of age. Three days after he had been buried, he appeared in the night to his son and asked him for something to eat. The son having given him something, he ate and disappeared. The next day the son recounted to his neighbors what had happened. That night the father did not appear, but the following night he showed himself and asked for something to eat. They know not whether the son gave him anything or not, but the next day he was found dead in his bed. On the same day, five or six persons fell suddenly ill in the village and died one after the other in a few days. The officer or bailiff of the place, when informed of what had happened, sent an account of it to the tribunal of Belgrade, which dispatched to the village two of these officers and an executioner to examine the affair. The imperial officer from whom we have this account repaired thither from Graditz, to be witness of a circumstance which he had so often heard spoken of. They opened the graves of those who had been dead six weeks. When they came to that of the old man, they found him with his eyes open, having a fine color, with natural respiration, nevertheless motionless as the dead. Whence they concluded that he was most evidently a vampire. The executioner drove a stake into his heart. They then raised a pile and reduced the corpse to ashes. No mark of vampirism was found either on the corpse or the sun or on the others. Thanks be to God, we are by no means credulous. We avow that all the light which physics can throw on this fact discovers none of the causes of it. Nevertheless, we cannot refuse to believe that to be true which is juridically attested and by persons of probity. The End Dead Persons in Hungary Who Suck the Blood of the Living About fifteen years ago, a soldier who was billeted at the house of a Hadamange peasant on the frontiers of Hungary, as he was one day sitting at table near his host, the master of the house saw a person he did not know come in and sit down to table also with them. The master of the house was strangely frightened at this, as were the rest of the company. The soldier knew not what to think of it, being ignorant of the matter in question. But the master of the house being dead the very next day, the soldier inquired what it meant. They told him that it was the body of the father of his host, who had been dead and buried for ten years, which had thus come to sit down next to him and had announced and caused his death. The soldier informed the regiment of it in the first place, and the regiment gave notice of it to the general officers, who commissioned the Count de Gabara, captain of the regiment of Allendetti Infantry, to make information concerning this circumstance. Having gone to the place with some other officers, a surgeon and an auditor, they heard the depositions of all the people belonging to the house, who attested unanimously that the ghost was the father of the master of the house and that all the soldier had said and reported was the exact truth, which was confirmed by all the inhabitants of the village. In consequence of this, the corpse of this spectre was exhumed, and found to be like that of a man who had just expired, and his blood like that of a living man. The Count de Gabara had his head cut off, and caused him to be laid again in his tomb. He also took information concerning other similar ghosts, amongst others, of a man dead more than thirty years who had come back three times to his house at mealtime. The first time he had sucked the blood from the neck of his own brother, the second time from one of his sons, and the third from one of the servants in the house, and all three died of it instantly and on the spot. Upon this deposition, the commissary had this man taken out of his grave, and finding that like the first the blood was in a fluid state, like that of a living person, he ordered them to run a large nail into his temple, and they lay him again in the grave. He caused a third to be burnt, 
who had been buried more than 16 years and had sucked the blood and caused the death of two of his sons. The commissary, having made his report to the general officers, was deputed to the court of the emperor, who commanded that some officers, both of war and justice, some physicians and surgeons, and some learned men, should be sent to examine the causes of these extraordinary events. The person who related these particulars to us had heard them from Monsieur, the Count de Gabarras, at Freiburg in Bregau in 1730. The End The Coffin Lid A moujik was driving along one night with a load of pots. His horse grew tired, and all of a sudden it came to a standstill alongside of a graveyard. The moujik unharnessed his horse and set it free to graze. Meanwhile, he laid himself down on one of the graves. But somehow he didn't go to sleep. He remained lying there for some time. Suddenly the grave began to open beneath him. He felt the movement and sprang to his feet. The grave opened, and out of it came a corpse, wrapped in a white shroud and holding a coffin lid came out and ran to the church, laid the coffin lid at the door, and then set off for the village. The moujik was a daring fellow. He picked up the coffin lid and remained standing beside his cart, waiting to see what would happen. After a short delay, the dead man came back and was going to snatch up his coffin lid, but it was not to be seen. Then the corpse began to track it out, traced it up to the moujik, and said, Give me my lid. If you don't, I will tear you to bits. And my hatchet? How about that? answers the moujik. Why, it's I who'll be chopping you into small pieces. Do give it back to me, good man, begs the corpse. I'll give it to you when you tell me where you've been and what you've done. Well, I've been in the village, and there I've killed a couple of youngsters. Well then, now tell me how they can be brought back to life. The corpse reluctantly made answer. Cut off the left skirt of my shroud and take it with you. When you come into the house where the youngsters were killed, pour some live coals into a pot and put the piece of the shroud in with them, and then lock the door. The lads will be revived by the smoke immediately. The moujik cut off the left skirt of the shroud and gave up the coffin lid. The corpse went to its grave. The grave opened. But just as the dead man was descending into it, all of a sudden the cocks began to crow and he hadn't time to get properly covered over. One end of the coffin lid remained sticking out of the ground. The moujik saw all this and made a note of it. The day began to dawn. He harnessed his horse and drove into the village. In one of the houses, he heard cries and wailing. In he went. There lay two dead lads. Don't cry, says he. I can bring them to life. Do bring them to life, kinsmen, says the relatives. We'll give you half of all we possess. The moujik did everything as the corpse had instructed him, and the lads came back to life. Their relatives were delighted, but they immediately seized the moujik and bound him with cords, saying, No, no, trickster. We'll hand you over to the authorities. Since you knew how to bring them back to life, maybe it was you who killed them. What are you talking about, true believers? Have the fear of God before your eyes, cried the moujik. Then he told them everything that had happened to him during the night. While they spread the news through the village, the whole population assembled and swarmed into the graveyard. They found out the grave from which the dead man had come out. They tore it open, and they drove an aspen stake right into the heart of the corpse, so that it might no more rise up and slay. But they rewarded the moujik richly and sent him away home with great honor. It is not only during sleep that the vampire is to be dreaded at crossroads or in the neighborhood of cemeteries an animated corpse of this description often lurks watching for some unwary wayfarer whom it may be able to slay and eat the end the soldier and the vampire a certain soldier was allowed to go home on furlough well he walked and walked and after a time he began to draw near to his native village not far off from that village lived a miller in his mill. In old times, the soldier had been very intimate with him. Why shouldn't he go and see his friend? He went. The miller received him cordially and at once brought out liquor, and the two began drinking and chattering about their ways and doings. 
All this took place towards nightfall, and the soldier stopped so long at the miller's that it grew quite dark. When he proposed to start for his village, his host exclaimed, Spend the night here, trooper. It's very late now, and perhaps you might run into mischief. How so? God is punishing us. The terrible warlock has died among us, and by night he rises from his grave, wanders through the village, and does such things as bring fear upon the very boldest. How could even you help being afraid of him? Not a bit of it. A soldier is a man who belongs to the crown, and crown property cannot be drowned in water nor burnt in fire. I'll be off. I'm tremendously anxious to see my people as soon as possible. Off, he set. His road lay in front of a graveyard. On one of the graves he saw a great fire blazing. What's that? thinks he. Let's have a look. When he drew near, he saw that the warlock was sitting by the fire sewing boots. Hail, brother, calls out the soldier. The warlock looked up and said, What have you come here for? Why, I wanted to see what you're doing. The warlock threw his work aside and invited the soldier to a wedding. Come along, brother, says he. Let's enjoy ourselves. There's a wedding going on in the village. Come along, says the soldier. They came to where the wedding was. There they were given drink and treated with the utmost hospitality. The warlock drank and drank, reveled and reveled, and then grew angry. He chased all the guests and relatives out of the house, threw the wedded pair into a slumber, took out two files and an awl, pierced the hands of the bride and bridegroom with the awl, and began drawing off their blood. Having done this, he said to the soldier, Now let's be off. Well, they went off. On the way, the soldier said, Tell me, why did you draw off their blood in those files? Why, in order that the bride and bridegroom might die. Tomorrow morning no one will be able to wake them. I alone know how to bring them back to life. How's that managed? The bride and bridegroom must have cuts made in their heels, and some of their own blood must then be poured back into those wounds. I've got the bridegroom's blood stowed away in my right-hand pocket and the bride's in my left. The soldier listened to this without letting a single word escape him. Then the warlock began boasting again. Whatever I wish says he, that I can do. I suppose it's quite impossible to get the better of you, says the soldier. Why impossible? If anyone were to make a pyre of aspen boughs, a hundred loads of them, and were to burn me on that pyre, then he'd be able to get the better of me. Only he'd have to look out sharp in burning me, for snakes and worms and different kinds of reptiles would creep out of my inside, and crows and magpies and jackdaws would come flying up. All these must be caught and flung on the pyre. If so much as a single maggot were to escape, then there'd be no help for it. In that maggot I should slip away. The soldier listened to all this and did not forget it. He and the warlock talked and talked, and at last they arrived at the grave. Well, brother, said the warlock, now I'll tear you to pieces. Otherwise you'd be telling all this. What are you talking about? Don't you deceive yourself. I serve God and the emperor. The warlock gnashed his teeth, howled aloud and sprang at the soldier, who drew his sword and began laying about him with sweeping blows. They struggled and struggled. The soldier was all but at the end of his strength. Ah, thinks he, I'm a lost man and all for nothing. Suddenly the cocks began to crow. The warlock fell lifeless to the ground. The soldier took the files of blood out of the warlock's pockets and went on to the house of his own people. When he had got there and exchanged greetings with his relatives, they said, Did you see any disturbance, soldier? No, I saw none. There now. Why, we've a terrible piece of work going on in the village. A warlock has taken to haunting it. After talking a while, they lay down to sleep. Next morning, the soldier awoke and began asking. I'm told you've got a wedding going on somewhere here. There was a wedding in the house of a rich Muyik, replies his relatives. But the bride and bridegroom have died this very night. What from? Nobody knows. Where does this Muyik live? They showed him the house. Thither he went without speaking a word. When he got there, he found the whole family in tears. 
What are you mourning about? says he. Such and such is the state of things, soldier, said they. I can bring your young people to life again. What will you give me if I do? Take what you like, even were it half of what we've got. The soldier did as the warlock had instructed him and brought the young people back to life. Instead of weeping, there began to be happiness and rejoicing. The soldier was hospitably treated and well rewarded. Then, left about, face off, he marched to the starosta and told him to call the peasants together and to get ready a hundred loads of aspen wood. Well, they took the wood into the graveyard, dragged the warlock out of his grave, placed him on the pyre and set it to light. The people all standing round in a circle with brooms, shovels and fire irons. The pyre became wrapped in flames. The warlock began to burn. His corpse burst and out of it crept snakes and worms and all sorts of reptiles. Then up came flying crows and magpies and jackdaws. The peasants knocked them down and flung them into the fire not allowing so much as a single maggot to creep away. And so the warlock was thoroughly consumed, and the soldier collected his ashes and strewn them to the winds. From that time forth there was peace in the village. The soldier received the thanks of the whole community. He stayed at home some time, enjoying himself thoroughly. Then he went back to the Tsar's service with money in his pocket. When he had served his time, he retired from the army and began to live at his ease. The End The Vampire Cat of Nabashima There is a tradition in the Nabashima family that many years ago, the prince of Hizen was bewitched and cursed by a cat that had been kept by one of his retainers. The prince had in his house a lady of rare beauty called Otoyo. Amongst all his ladies, she was the favorite, and there was none who could rival her charms and accomplishments. One day the prince went into the garden with Otoyo and remained enjoying the fragrance of the flowers until sunset, when they returned to the palace never noticing that they were being followed by a large cat. Having parted with her lord, Otoyo retired to her own room and went to bed. At midnight she awoke with a start and became aware of a huge cat that crouched watching her, and when she cried out the beast sprang on her and fixing its cruel teeth into her delicate throat throttled her to death. What a piteous end for so fair a dame, the darling of her prince's heart, to die suddenly bitten to death by a cat. Then the cat, having scratched out a grave under the veranda, buried the corpse of Otoyo, and assuming her form began to bewitch the prince. But my lord the prince knew nothing of all this, and little thought that the beautiful creature who caressed and fondled him was an impish and foul beast that had slain his mistress and assumed her shape in order to drain out his life's blood. Day by day, as time went on, the prince's strength dwindled away. The color of his face was changed and became pale and livid, and he was as a man suffering from a deadly sickness. Seeing this, his counselors and his wife became greatly alarmed. So they summoned the physicians who prescribed various remedies for him. But the more medicine he took, the more serious did his illness appear, and no treatment was of any avail. But most of all did he suffer in the night time when his sleep would be troubled and disturbed by hideous dreams. In consequence of this, his counselors nightly appointed a hundred of his retainers to sit up and watch over him. But strange to say, towards ten o'clock on the very first night that the watch was set, the guard were seized with a sudden and unaccountable drowsiness, which they could not resist, until one by one every man had fallen asleep. Then the false Otoyo came in and harassed the prince until morning. The following night the same thing occurred, and the prince was subjected to the imp's tyranny while his guards slept helplessly about him. Night after night this was repeated, until at last three of the prince's counselors determined themselves to sit up on guard and see whether they could overcome this mysterious drowsiness. But they fared no better than the others, and by ten o'clock were fast asleep. The next day, the three counselors held a solemn conclave, and their chief, one Ishaya Buzan, said, This is a marvelous thing, that a guard of a hundred men should thus be overcome by sleep. Of a surety, the spell that is upon my lord and upon his guard must be the work of witchcraft. Now, as all of our efforts are of no avail, let us seek out Rutin, the chief priest of the temple called Mio in 
and beseech him to put our prayers for the recovery of my lord. And the other counselors, approving what the Shia Buzin had said, they went to the priest Ruten and engaged him to recite litanies that the prince might be restored to health. So it came to pass that Ruten, the chief priest of Mayo Inn, offered up prayers nightly for the prince. One night, at the ninth hour, midnight, when he had finished his religious exercises and was preparing to lie down to sleep, he fancied that he heard a noise outside in the garden, as if someone were washing himself at the well. Deeming this passage strange, he looked down from the window, and there, in the moonlight, he saw a handsome young soldier, some twenty-four years of age, washing himself, who, when he had finished cleaning himself and put on his clothes, stood before the figure of Buddha and prayed fervently for the recovery of my lord the prince. Rutin looked on with admiration, and the young man, when he had made an end of his prayer, was going away, but the priest stopped him, calling out to him, Sir, I pray you to tarry a little. I have something to say to you. At your reverence's service, what may you please to want? Pray be so good as to step up here and have a little talk. By your reverence's leave. And with this he went upstairs. Then Rutin said, Sir, I cannot conceal my admiration that you, being so young a man, should have so loyal a spirit. I am Rutin, the chief priest of this temple, who am engaged in praying for the recovery of my lord. Pray what is your name? My name, sir, is Ito Soda, and I am serving in the infantry of Nabashima. Since my lord has been sick, my one desire has been to assist in nursing him. But being only a simple soldier, I am not of sufficient rank to come into his presence. So I have no resource but to pray to the gods of the country and to Buddha that my lord may regain his health. When Ruten heard this, he shed tears in admiration of the fidelity of Ito Soda, and said, your purpose is, indeed, a good one. But what a strange sickness this is that my lord is afflicted with. Every night he suffers from horrible dreams, and the retainers who sit up with him are all seized with a mysterious sleep, so that not one can keep awake. It is very wonderful. Yes, replied Soda. After a moment's reflection, this certainly must be witchcraft. If I could but obtain leave to sit up one night with the prince, I would fain see whether I could not resist this drowsiness and detect the goblin. At last, the priest said, I am in relations of friendship with Ishai Abuzen, the chief counselor of the prince. I will speak to him of you and your loyalty, and will intercede with him that you may attain your wish. Indeed, sir, I am most thankful. I am not prompted by any vain thought of self-advancement. Should I succeed, all I wish for is the recovery of my lord. I commend myself to your kind favor. Well, then, tomorrow night, I will take you with me to the counselor's house. Thank you, sir, and farewell. And so they parted. On the following evening, Ito Soda returned to the temple Mayu Inn, and having found Rutin, accompanied him to the house of Ashaya Buzen. Then the priest, leaving Soda outside, went in to converse with the counselor and inquire after the prince's health. And pray, sir, how is my lord? Is he in any better condition since I've been offering up prayers for him? Indeed, no. His illness is very severe. We are certain that he must be the victim of some foul sorcery. But as there are no means of keeping a guard awake after ten o'clock, we cannot catch a sight of the goblin, so we are in the greatest trouble. I feel deeply for you. It must be most distressing. However, I have something to tell you. I think that I have found a man who will detect the goblin, and I have brought him with me. Indeed, who is the man? Well, he is one of my lord's foot soldiers named Ito Soda, a faithful fellow, and I trust that you will grant his request to be permitted to sit up with my lord. Certainly, it is wonderful to find so much loyalty and zeal in a common soldier, replied Ashaya Buzan after a moment's reflection. Still, it is impossible to allow a man of such low rank to perform the office of watching over my lord. It is true that he is but a common soldier, urged the priest. But why not raise his rank in consideration of his fidelity and then let him mount guard? 
It would be time enough to promote him after my lord's recovery, but come, let me see this Ito Soda, that I may know what manner of man he is. If he pleases me, I will consult with the other counselors, and perhaps we may grant his request. I will bring him forthwith, replied Ruten, who thereupon went out to fetch the young man. When he returned, the priest presented Ito Soda to the counselor, who looked at him attentively, and being pleased with his comely and gentle appearance, said, So I hear that you are anxious to be permitted to mount guard in my lord's room at night. Well, I must consult with the other counselors, and we will see what can be done for you. When the young soldier heard this, he was greatly elated and took his leave, after warmly thanking Buzen, who had helped him to gain his object. The next day, the counselors held a meeting and sent for Ito Soda and told him that he might keep watch with the other retainers that very night. So he went his way in high spirits, and at nightfall, having made all his preparations, took his place among the hundred gentlemen who were on duty in the prince's bedroom. Now the prince slept in the center of the room, and the hundred guards around him sat keeping themselves awake with entertaining conversation and pleasant conceits. But as ten o'clock approached, they began to doze off as they sat, and in spite of all their endeavors to keep one another awake, by degrees they all fell asleep. Ito Soda all this while felt an irresistible desire to sleep creeping over him and though he tried by all sorts of ways to rouse himself, he saw that there was no help for it. But by resorting to an extreme measure for which he had already made his preparations, drawing out a piece of oil paper which he had brought with him and spreading it over the mats, he sat down upon it. Then he took the small knife which he carried in the sheath of his dirk and stuck it into his own thigh. For a while the pain of the wound kept him awake, but as the slumber by which he was assailed was the work of sorcery, little by little he became drowsy again. Then he twisted the knife around and around in his thigh, so that the pain becoming very violent, he was proof against the feeling of sleepiness, and kept a faithful watch. Now the oil paper which he had spread under his legs was in order to prevent the blood which might spurt from his wound from defiling the mats. So Ito Soda remained awake, but the rest of the guards slept, and as he watched, Suddenly the sliding doors of the prince's room were drawn open, and he saw a figure coming in stealthily, and as it drew near, the form was that of a marvelously beautiful woman some twenty-three years of age. Cautiously she looked around her, and when she saw that all the guard were asleep, she smiled an ominous smile, and was going up to the prince's bedside, when she perceived that in one corner of the room there was a man yet awake. This seemed to startle her. But she went up to Soda and said, I'm not used to seeing you here. Who are you? My name is Ito Soda, and this is the first night that I've been on guard. A troublesome office, truly. Why, here are all the rest of the guard asleep. How is it that you alone are awake? You are a trusty watchman. There is nothing to boast about. I'm asleep myself, fast and sound. What is that wound on your knee? It's all red with blood. Oh, I felt very sleepy, so I stuck my knife into my thigh, and the pain of it has kept me awake. What wondrous loyalty, said the lady. Is it not the duty of a retainer to lay down his life for his master? Is such a scratch as this worth thinking about? Then the lady went up to the sleeping prince and said, How fares it with my lord tonight? But the prince, worn out with sickness, made no reply. But Soda was watching her eagerly, and guessed that it was Otoyo, and made up his mind that if she attempted to harass the prince, he would kill her on the spot. The goblin, however, which in the form of Otoyo had been tormenting the prince every night, and had come again that night for no other purpose, was defeated by the watchfulness of Ito Soda. For whenever she drew near to the sick man, thinking to put her spells upon him, she would turn and look behind her and there she saw Ito Soda glaring at her. So she had no help for it but to go away again, and leave the prince undisturbed. At last the day broke, and the other officers, when they awoke and opened their eyes, saw that Ito Soda had kept awake by stabbing himself in the thigh, and they were greatly ashamed and went home crestfallen. That morning Ito Soda went to the house of Ishaya Buzan, and told him all that had occurred the previous night. 
The counselors were all loud in their praises of Ito Soda's behavior and ordered him to keep watch again that night. At the same hour, the false Otoyo came and looked all around the room, and all the guard were asleep excepting Ito Soda, who was wide awake, and so being again frustrated, she returned to her own apartments. Now, as since Soda has been on guard the prince's past quiet nights, his sickness began to get better, and there was great joy in the palace, and Soda was promoted and rewarded with an estate. In the meanwhile, Otoyo, seeing that her nightly visits bore no fruits, kept away and from that time forth the night guard were no longer subject to fits of drowsiness. This coincidence struck Soda as very strange, so he went to Ishaya Buzan and told him that of a certainty this Otoyo was no other than a goblin. Ishaya Buzan reflected for a while and said, Well then, how shall we kill the foul thing? I will go to the creature's room, as if nothing were the matter, and try to kill her but in case she should try to escape, I will beg you to order eight men to stop outside and lie in wait for her. Having agreed upon this plan, Soda went at nightfall to Otoyo's apartment, pretending to have been sent with a message from the prince. When she saw him arrive, she said, What message have you brought me from my lord? Oh, nothing in particular. Be so good as to look at this letter. And as he spoke, he drew near to her, and suddenly drawing his dirk, cut at her. But the goblin, springing back, seized a halberd, and glaring fiercely at Soda, said, How dare you behave like this to one of your lord's ladies? I will have you dismissed. And she tried to strike Soda with the halberd, but Soda fought desperately with his dirk, and the goblin, seeing that she was no match for him, threw away the halberd and from a beautiful woman became suddenly transformed into a cat, which, springing up the sides of the room, jumped onto the roof. Ishaya Buzan and his eight men, who were watching outside, shot at the cat, but missed it, and the beast made good its escape. So the cat fled to the mountains, and did much mischief among the surrounding people, until at last the prince of Hizan ordered a great hunt, and the beast was killed. But the prince recovered from his sickness, and Ito Soda was richly rewarded. The End The Old Portrait Old-fashioned frames are a hobby of mine. I'm always on the prowl amongst the framers and dealers in curiosities for something quaint and unique in picture frames. I don't care much for what is inside them, for being a painter... It is my fancy to get the frames first and then paint a picture which I think suits their probable history and design. In this way, I get some curious and I think also some original ideas. One day in December, about a week before Christmas, I picked up a fine but dilapidated specimen of wood carving in a shop near Soho. The gilding had been worn nearly away and three of the corners broken off. Yet, as there was one of the corners still left, I hoped to be able to repair the others from it. As for the canvas inside the frame, it was so smothered with dirt and time stains that I could only distinguish it had been a very badly painted likeness of some sort, of some commonplace person daubed in by a poor pot-boiling painter to fill in the second-hand frame which his patron may have picked up cheaply as I had done after him. But as the frame was all right, I took the spoiled canvas along with it, thinking it might come in handy. For the next few days, my hands were full of work of one kind and another, so that it was only on Christmas Eve that I found myself at liberty to examine my purchase, which had been lying with its face to the wall since I had brought it to my studio. Having nothing to do on this night and not in the mood to go out, I got my picture and frame from the corner and laying them on the table with a sponge, basin of water, and some soap, I began to wash so that I might see them the better. They were in a terrible mess, and I think I used the best part of a packet of soap powder and had to change the water about a dozen times before the pattern began to show up on the frame, and the portrait within it asserted its awful crudeness, vile drawing, and intense vulgarity. It was the bloated, piggish visage of a publican, clearly, with a plentiful supply of jewelry displayed, as is usual with such masterpieces, where the features are not considered of so much importance as a strict fidelity in the depicting of such articles as watchguard and seals, finger rings and breastpins. 
These were all there, as natural and hard as reality. The frame delighted me, and the picture satisfied me that I had not cheated the dealer with my price, and I was looking at the monstrosity as the gaslight beat full upon it, and wondering how the owner could be pleased with himself as thus depicted. When something about the background attracted my attention, a slight marking underneath the thin coating as if the portrait had been painted over some other subject. It was not much, certainly, yet enough to make me rush over to my cupboard, where I kept my spirits of wine and turpentine, with which, and a plentiful supply of rags, I began to demolish the publican ruthlessly in the vague hope that I might find something worth looking at underneath. A slow process that was, as well as a delicate one, so that it was close upon midnight before the gold cable rings and vermilion visage disappeared, and another picture loomed up before me. Then giving it the final wash over, I wiped it dry and set it in a good light on my easel. While I filled and lit my pipe and then sat down to look at it. What had I liberated from that vile prison of crude paint? For I did not require to set it up to know that this bungler of the brush had covered and defiled a work as far beyond his comprehension as the clouds are from the caterpillar. The bust and head of a young woman of uncertain age merged with the gloom of rich accessories painted as only a master hand can paint, who is above asserting his knowledge, and who has learnt to cover his technique. It was as perfect and natural in its somber yet quiet dignity as if it had come from the brush of Moroni, a face and neck perfectly colorless in their pallid whiteness, with the shadows so artfully managed that they could not be seen and for this quality would have delighted the strong-minded Queen Bess. At first, as I looked, I saw in the center of a vague darkness a dim patch of grey gloom that drifted into the shadow. Then the greyness appeared to grow lighter as I sat from it and leaned back in my chair until the features stole out softly and became clear and definite, while the figure stood out from the background as if tangible, although, having washed it, I knew that it had been smoothly painted. An intent face with delicate nose, well-shaped, although bloodless lips, and eyes like dark caverns without a spark of light in them. The hair loosely about the head and oval cheeks, massive, silky textured, jet black and lusterless, which hid the upper portion of her brow with the ears and fell in straight indefinite waves over the left breast, leaving the right portion of the transparent neck exposed. The dress and background were symphonies of ebony, yet full of subtle coloring and masterly feeling. A dress of rich brocaded velvet with a background that represented vast receding space, wondrously suggestive and awe-inspiring. I noticed that the pallid lips were parted slightly and showed a glimpse of the upper front teeth, which added to the intent expression of the face. A short upper lip, which curled upward with the underlip full and sensuous, or rather, if color had been in it, would have been so. It was an eerie-looking face that I resurrected on this midnight hour of Christmas Eve. In its passive pallidity, it looked as if the blood had been drained from the body, and that I was gazing upon an open-eyed corpse. The frame also, I noticed, for the first time in its details, appeared to have been designed with the intention of carrying out the idea of life and death. What had before looked like scrollwork of flowers and fruit were loathsome, snake-like worms, twined amongst charnel house bones which they half covered in a decorative fashion. A hideous design in spite of his exquisite workmanship that made me shudder and wish that I had left the cleaning to be done by daylight. I am not at all of a nervous temperament and would have laughed had anyone told me that I was afraid, and yet, as I sat here alone... With that portrait opposite to me in this solitary studio, away from all human contact, for none of the other studios were tenanted on this night and the janitor had gone on his holiday, I wished that I had spent my evening in a more congenial manner, for in spite of a good fire in the stove and the brilliant gas, that intent face and those haunting eyes were exercising a strange influence upon me. I heard the clocks from the different steeples chime out the last hour of the day, one after the other, like echoes taking up the refrain and dying away in the distance. And still I sat spellbound looking at that weird picture, with my neglected pipe in my hand, and a strange lassitude creeping over me. 
It was the eyes which fixed me now with the unfathomable depths and absorbing intensity. They gave out no light, but seemed to draw my soul into them, and with it my life and strength as I lay inert before them, until overpowered I lost consciousness and dreamt. I thought that the frame was still on the easel with the canvas, but the woman had stepped from them and was approaching me with a floating motion, leaving behind her vault filled with coffins. Some of them shut down whilst others lay or stood upright and open, showing the grisly contents and their decaying and stained cerements. I could only see her head and shoulders with the somber drapery of the upper portion and the inky wealth of hair hanging round. She was with me now, that pallid face touching my face and those cold bloodless lips glued to mine with a close, lingering kiss while the soft black hair covered me like a cloud and thrilled me through and through, with a delicious thrill that, whilst it made me grow faint, intoxicated me with delight. As I breathed, she seemed to absorb it quickly into herself, giving me back nothing, getting stronger as I was becoming weaker, while the warmth of my contact passed into her and made her palpitate with vitality. And all at once the horror of approaching death seized upon me, and with a frantic effort I flung her from me and started up from my chair, dazed for a moment and uncertain where I was. Then consciousness returned and I looked around wildly. The gas was still blazing brightly while the fire burned ruddy in the stove. By the timepiece on the mantel I could see that it was half past twelve. The picture and frame were still on the easel. Only as I looked at them the portrait had changed. A hectic flush was on the cheeks while the eyes glittered with life and the sensuous lips were red and ripe. Looking with a drop of blood still upon the nether one, in a frenzy of horror I seized my scraping knife and slashed out the vampire picture, and then tearing the mutilated fragments out I crammed them into my stove and watched them frizzle with savage delight. I have that frame still, but I have not yet had the courage to paint the suitable subject for it. The End The Vampire Maid It was the exact kind of abode that I had been looking after for weeks, for I was in that condition of mind when absolute renunciation of society was a necessity. I had become diffident of myself and wearied of my kind. A strange unrest was in my blood, a barren dearth in my brains. Familiar objects and faces had grown distasteful to me. I wanted to be alone. This is the mood which comes upon every sensitive and artistic mind when the possessor has been overworked or living too long in one groove. It is nature's hint for him to seek pastures new, the sign that a retreat has become needful. If he does not yield, he breaks down and becomes whimsical and hypochondrical, as well as hypocritical. It is always a bad sign when a man becomes overcritical and censorious about his own or other people's work, for it means that he is losing the vital portions of work, freshness, and enthusiasm. Before I arrived at the dismal stage of criticism, I hastily packed up my knapsack and, taking the train to Westmoreland, I began my tramp in search of solitude, bracing air and romantic surroundings. Many places I came upon during that early summer wandering that appeared to have almost the required conditions, yet some petty drawback prevented me from deciding. Sometimes it was the scenery that I did not take kindly to. At other places I took sudden antipathies to the landlady or landlord, and felt I would abhor them before a week was spent under their charge. Other places which might have suited me I could not have, as they did not want a lodger. Fate was driving me to this cottage on the moor, and no one can resist destiny. One day I found myself on a wide and pathless moor near the sea. I had slept the night before at a small hamlet, but that was already eight miles in my rear, and since I had turned my back upon it I had not seen any signs of humanity. I was alone with a fair sky above me, a balmy, ozone-filled wind blowing over the stony and heather-clad mounds and nothing to disturb my meditations. How far the moor stretched I had no knowledge. I only knew that by keeping in a straight line I would come to the ocean cliffs, then perhaps after a time at some fishing village. I had provisions in my knapsack and, being young, did not fear a night under the stars. 
I was inhaling the delicious summer air and once more getting back the vigor and happiness I had lost. My city-dried brains were again becoming juicy. Thus, hour after hour slid past me, with the paces until I had covered about fifteen miles since morning, when I saw before me in the distance a solitary stone-built cottage with a roughly slated roof. I'll camp there if possible, I said to myself as I quickened my steps towards it. To one in search of a quiet, free life, nothing could have possibly been more suitable than this cottage. It stood on the edge of lofty cliffs, with its front door facing the moor and the backyard wall overlooking the ocean. The sound of the dancing waves struck upon my ears like a lullaby as I drew near. How they would thunder when the autumn gales came on and the seabirds fled shrieking to the shelter of the sedges. A small garden spread in front, surrounded by a dry stone wall just high enough for one to lean lazily upon when inclined. This garden was a flame of color, scarlet predominating, with those other soft shades that cultivated poppies take on in their blooming, for this was all that the garden grew. As I approached, taking notice of the singular assortment of poppies and the orderly cleanness of the windows, the front door opened and a woman appeared who impressed me at once favorably as she leisurely came along the pathway to the gate and drew it back as if to welcome me. She was of middle age and when young must have been remarkably good looking. She was tall and still shapely with smooth clear skin, regular features and a calm expression that at once gave me a sensation of rest. To my inquiries, she said that she could give me both a sitting and a bedroom and invited me inside to see them. As I looked at her smooth black hair and cool brown eyes, I felt that I would not be too particular about the accommodation. With such a landlady, I was sure to find what I was after here. The room surpassed my expectation. Dainty white curtains and bedding with the perfume of lavender about them. A sitting room, homely yet cozy without being crowded. With a sigh of infinite relief, I flung down my knapsack and clinched the bargain. She was a widow with one daughter, whom I did not see the first day, as she was unwell and confined to her own room. But on the next day she was somewhat better, and then we met. The fare was simple, yet it suited me exactly for the time. Delicious milk and butter with homemade scones, fresh eggs and bacon. After a hearty tea I went early to bed in a condition of perfect content with my quarters. Yet happy and tired out as I was, I had by no means a comfortable night. This I put down to the strange bed. I slept certainly, but my sleep was filled with dreams so that I woke late and unrefreshed. A good walk on the moor, however, restored me, and I returned with a fine appetite for breakfast. Certain conditions of mind with aggravating circumstances are required before even a young man can fall in love at first sight as Shakespeare has shown in his Romeo and Juliet. In the city, where many fair faces passed me every hour, I had remained like a stoic. Yet no sooner did I enter the cottage after that morning walk than I succumbed instantly before the weird charms of my landlady's daughter, Ariadne Brunel. She was somewhat better this morning and able to meet me at breakfast, for we had our meals together while I was their lodger. Ariadne was not beautiful in the strictly classical sense, her complexion being too lividly white and her expression too set to be quite pleasant at first sight. Yet, as her mother had informed me, she had been ill for some time, which accounted for that defect. Her features were not regular, her hair and eyes seemed too black with that strangely white skin, and her lips too red for any except the decadent harmonies of an Aubrey Beardsley. Yet my fantastic dreams of the preceding night with my morning walk had prepared me to be enthralled by this modern poster-like invalid. The loneliness of the moor with the singing of the ocean had gripped my heart with a wistful longing. The incongruity of those flaunting and evanescent poppy flowers dashing the giddy tints in the face of that sober heath touched me with a shiver as I approached the cottage. And lastly, that weird embodiment of startling contrast completed my subjugation. She rose from her chair as her mother introduced her, and smiled while she held out her hand. I clasped that soft snowflake, and as I did so, a faint thrill tingled over me and rested on my heart, stopping for the moment its beating. 
This contact seemed also to have affected her as it did me. A clear flush like a white flame lighted up her face, so that it glowed as if an alabaster lamp had been lit. Her black eyes became softer and more humid as her glances crossed, and her scarlet lips grew moist. She was a living woman now, while before she had seemed half a corpse. She permitted her white, slender hand to remain in mine longer than most people do at an introduction, and then she slowly withdrew it, still regarding me with steadfast eyes for a second or two afterwards. Fathomless, velvety eyes those were. Yet before they were shifted from mine, they appeared to have absorbed all my willpower and made me her abject slave. They looked like deep, dark pools of clear water, yet they filled me with fire and deprived me of strength. I sank into my chair almost as languidly as I had risen from my bed that morning. Yet I made a good breakfast, and although she hardly tasted anything, the strange girl rose much refreshed and with a slight glow of color on her cheeks, which improved her so greatly that she appeared younger and almost beautiful. I had come here seeking solitude, but since I had seen Ariadne, it seemed as if I had come for her only. She was not very lively. Indeed, thinking back, I cannot recall any spontaneous remark of hers. She answered my questions by monosyllables and left me to lead in words. Yet she was insinuating and appeared to lead my thoughts in her direction and speak to me with her eyes. I cannot describe her minutely. I only know that from the first glance and touch she gave me, I was bewitched and could think of nothing else. It was a rapid, distracting, and devouring infatuation that possessed me. All day long I followed her about like a dog. Every night I dreamed of that white glowing face, those steadfast black eyes, those moist scarlet lips, and each morning I rose more languid than I had been the day before. Sometimes I dreamt that she was kissing me with those red lips while I shivered at the contact of her silky black tresses as they covered my throat. Sometimes that we were floating in the air, her arms about me and her long hair enveloping us both like an inky cloud, while I lay supine and helpless. She went with me after breakfast on that first day to the moor, and before we came back I had spoken my love and received her assent. I held her in my arms and had taken her kisses in answer to mine. Nor did I think it strange that all this had happened so quickly. She was mine, or rather, I was hers, without a pause. I told her it was fate that she had sent me to her, for I had no doubts about my love and she replied that I had restored her to life. Acting upon Ariadne's advice, and also from a natural shyness, I did not inform her mother how quickly matters had progressed between us, yet although we both acted as circumspectly as possible, I had no doubt that Mrs. Brunel could see how engrossed we were in each other. Lovers are not unlike ostriches in their modes of concealment. I was not afraid of asking Mrs. Brunel for her daughter, for she already showed her partiality towards me and had bestowed upon me some confidences regarding her own position in life, and I therefore knew that, so far as social position was concerned, there could be no real objection to our marriage. They lived in this lovely spot for the sake of their health, and kept no servant because they could not get any to take service so far away from other humanity. My coming had the opportune and welcome to both mother and daughter. For the sake of decorum, however, I resolved to delay my confession for a week or two and trust to some favorable opportunity of doing it discreetly. Meantime, Ariadne and I passed our time in a thoroughly idle and lotus-eating style. Each night I retired to bed meditating, starting work next day. Each morning I rose languid from those disturbing dreams with no thought for anything outside my love. She grew stronger every day while I appeared to be taking her place as the invalid. Yet I was more frantically in love than ever, and only happy when with her. She was my lone star, my only joy, my life. We did not go great distances, for I liked best to lie on the dry heath and watch her glowing face and intense eyes, while I listened to the surging of the distant waves. It was love made me lazy, I thought for unless a man has all he longs for beside him, he is apt to copy the domestic cat and bask in the sunshine. 
I had been enchanted quickly. My disenchantment came as rapidly, although it was long before the poison left my blood. One night, about a couple of weeks after my coming to the cottage, I had returned after a delicious moonlight walk with Ariadne. The night was warm and the moon at the full. Therefore, I left my bedroom window open to let in what little air there was. I was more than usually fagged out, so that I only had strength enough to remove my boots and coat before I flung myself wearily on the coverlet and fell almost instantly asleep without tasting the nightcap draft. It was constantly placed on the table, and which I had always drained thirstily. I had a ghastly dream this night. I thought I saw a monster bat, with the face and tresses of Ariadne, fly into the open window and fasten its white teeth and scarlet lips on my arm. I tried to beat the horror away, but could not, for I seemed chained down and thralled also with drowsy delight as the beast sucked my blood with a gruesome rapture. I looked out dreamily and saw a line of dead bodies of young men lying on the floor, each with a red mark on their arms, on the same part where the vampire was then sucking me, and I remembered having seen and wondered at such a mark on my own arm for the past fortnight. In a flash, I understood the reason for my strange weakness, and at the same moment a sudden prick of pain roused me from my dreamy pleasure. The vampire, in her eagerness, had bitten a little too deeply that night unaware that I had not tasted the drugged draught. As I woke, I saw her fully revealed by the midnight moon, with her black tresses flowing loosely, and with her red lips glued to my arm. With a shriek of horror, I dashed her backwards, getting one last glimpse of her savage eyes, glowing white face, and blood-stained red lips. Then I rushed out to the night, moved on by my fear and hatred, nor did I pause in my mad flight until I had left miles between me and that accursed cottage on the moor. The End The Vampire of Croglin Grange Captain Fisher also told us this really extraordinary story connected with his own family. Fisher may sound a very plebeian name, but this family is of very ancient lineage and for many hundreds of years they have possessed a very curious sort of place in Cumberland, which bears the weird name of Croglin Grange. The great characteristic of the house is that never at any period of its very long existence has it been more than one story high, but it has a terrace from which large grounds sweep away towards the church in the hollow, and a fine, distant view. When, in lapse of years, the fishers outgrew Croglin Grange in family and fortune, they were wise enough not to destroy the long-standing characteristic of the place by adding another story to the house, but they went away to the south to reside at Thorncombe near Guildford, and they let Croglin Grange. They were extremely fortunate in their tenants, two brothers and a sister. They heard their praises from all quarters. To their poorer neighbors, they were all that is most kind and beneficent, and their neighbors of a higher class spoke of them as the most welcome addition to the little society of the neighborhood. On their part, the tenants were greatly delighted with their new residence. The arrangement of the house, which would have been a trial to many, was not so to them. In every respect, Croglin Grange was exactly suited to them. The winter was spent most happily by the new inmates of Croglin Grange, who shared in all the little social pleasures of the district, and made themselves very popular. In the following summer, there was one day which was dreadfully, annihilatingly hot. The brothers lay under the trees with their books, for which it was too hot for any active occupation. The sisters sat in the veranda and worked, or tried to work, for in the intense sultriness of that hot summer day, work was next to impossible. They dined early, and after dinner they sat out in the veranda, enjoying the cool air which came with evening, and they watched the sunset and the moon rise over the belt of the trees which separated the grounds from the churchyard seeing it mount the heavens till the whole lawn was bathed in silver light, across which the long shadows from the shrubbery fell as if embossed, so vivid and distinct were they. When they separated for the night, all retiring to the rooms on the ground floor, for, as I said, there was no upstairs in that house, the sister felt that the heat was so great that she could not sleep, and having fastened her window, she did not close the shutters. In that very quiet place it was not necessary, 
and propped against the pillows, she still watched the wonderful and marvelous beauty of the summer night. Gradually, she became aware of two lights, two lights which flickered in and out in the belt of trees which separated the lawn from the churchyard. And as her gaze became fixed upon them, she saw them emerge, fixed in a dark substance, a definite ghastly something, which seemed every moment to become nearer, increasing in size and substance as it approached. Every now and then it was lost for a moment in the long shadows which stretched across the lawn from the trees. And then it emerged, larger than ever, and still coming on, on, as she watched it. The most uncontrollable horror seized her. She longed to get away, but the door was close to the window and the door was locked on the inside. And while she was unlocking it, she must be for an instant nearer to it. She longed to scream, but her voice seemed paralyzed, her tongue glued to the roof of her mouth. Suddenly, she never could explain why afterwards the terrible object seemed to turn to one side, seemed to be going round the house, not to be coming to her at all and immediately she jumped out of bed and rushed to the door. But as she was unlocking it, she heard scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window and saw a hideous brown face with flaming eyes glaring in at her. She rushed back to the bed, but the creature continued to scratch, scratch, scratch on the window. She felt a sort of mental comfort in the knowledge that the window was securely fastened on the inside. Suddenly, the scratching sound ceased, and a kind of pecking sound took its place. Then, in her agony, she became aware that the creature was unpicking the lead. The noise continued, and the diamond pane of glass fell into the room. Then a long, bony finger of the creature came in and turned the handle of the window, and the window opened, and the creature came in, and it came across the room, and her terror was so great that she could not scream and it came up to the bed and twisted its long bony fingers in her hair and dragged her head over the side of the bed. And it bit her violently in the throat. As it bit her, her voice was released, and she screamed with all her might and mane. Her brothers rushed out of their rooms, but the door was locked on the inside. A moment was lost while they got a poker and broke it open. Then the creature had already escaped through the window, and the sister, bleeding violently from a wound in the throat, was lying unconscious over the side of the bed. One brother pursued the creature, which fled before him through the moonlight with gigantic strides, and eventually seemed to disappear over the wall into the churchyard. Then he rejoined his brother by the sister's bedside. She was dreadfully hurt, and her wound was a very definite one, but she was of strong disposition not to given either to romance or superstition. And when she came to herself, she said, What has happened is most extraordinary, and I am very much hurt. It seems inexplicable, but of course there is an explanation, and we must wait for it. It will turn out that a lunatic has escaped from some asylum and found his way here. The wound healed, and she appeared to get well, but the doctor who was sent for would not believe that she could bear so terrible a shock so easily, and insisted that she must have change, mental and physical, so her brothers took her to Switzerland. Being a sensible girl, when she went abroad, she threw herself at once into the interests of the country she was in. She dried plants, she made sketches, she went up mountains, and as autumn came on, she was the person who urged that they should return to Crogland Grange. We have taken it, she said, for seven years, and we have only been there once and we shall always find it difficult to let a house which is only one story high. So we had better return there. Lunatics do not escape every day. As she urged it, her brothers wished nothing better, and the family returned to Cumberland. From there being no upstairs in the house, it was impossible to make any great change in arrangements. The sister occupied the same room, but it is unnecessary to say she always closed her shutters which, however, as in many old houses, always left one top pane of the window uncovered. The brothers moved and occupied a room together exactly opposite that of their sister, and they always kept loaded pistols in their room. The winter passed most peacefully and happily. In the following March, the sister was suddenly awakened by a sound she remembered only too well. Scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window, and looking up she saw... 
climbed up to the topmost pane of the window, the same hideous brown shriveled face with glaring eyes looking in at her. This time she screamed as loud as she could. Her brothers rushed out of their room with pistols and out the front door. The creature was already scudding away across the lawn. One of the brothers fired and hit it in the leg. But still, with the other leg, it continued to make way, scrambled over the wall into the churchyard, and seemed to disappear into a vault which belonged to the family long extinct. The next day, the brothers summoned all the tenants at Crogland Grange, and in their presence the vault was opened. A horrible scene revealed itself. The vault was full of coffins. They had been broken open, and their contents, horribly mangled and distorted, were scattered over the floor. One coffin alone remained intact. Of that, the lid had been lifted, but still lay loose upon the coffin. They raised it, and there, brown, withered, shriveled, mummified, but quite entire, was the same hideous figure which had looked in at the windows of Crogland Grange, with the marks of a recent pistol shot in the leg. And they did the only thing that can lay a vampire. They burnt it. The End The Singular Death of Morton Dusk was melting into darkness as the two men slowly made their way through the dense forest of spruce and fir that clothed the flanks of the mountain. They were weary with the long climb, for neither was in his first youth, and the July day had been a hot one. Their little inn lay further in the valley among the orchards that separated the forest from the vineyards. Neither of them talked much. The big man led the way, carrying the knapsack, and his companion, older, shorter, evidently the more fatigued of the two, followed with small footsteps. From time to time he stumbled among the loose rocks. An exceptionally observant mind would possibly have divined that his stumbling was not entirely due to fatigue but to an absorption of spirit that made him careless how he walked. All right, behind? The big man would call from time to time, half glancing back. Eh, what? The other would reply, startled, out of a reverie. Pace too fast? Not a bit, I'm coming. And once, he added, you might hurry on and see to supper, if you feel like it. I shan't be long behind you. But his big friend did not adopt this suggestion. He kept the same distance between them. He called out the same question at intervals. Once or twice he stopped and looked back, too. In this way they came at length to the skirts of the wood. A deep hush covered all the valley. The limestone ridges they had climbed gleamed down white and ghostly upon them from the fading sky. Midway in its journeys the evening wind dropped suddenly to watch the beauty of the moonlight to hold the branches still so that the light may slip between and weave its silver pattern on the moss below. And as they stood a moment to take it in, a step sounded behind them on the soft pine needles, and the older man, still a little in the rear, turned with a start as though he had been suddenly called by name. There's that girl, again, he said, as his voice expressed a curious mingling of pleasure, surprise, and apprehension. Into a patch of moonlight passed the figure of a young girl, looked at them as though about to stop, yet, thinking better of it, smiled softly, and moved on out of sight into the surrounding darkness. The moon just caught her eyes and teeth, so that they shone. The rest of her body stood in shadow. The effect was striking, almost as though head and shoulders hung alone in midair, watching them with the shining smile then fading away. Come on, for heaven's sake the big man cried. There was impatience in his manner, not unkindness. The other lingered a moment, peering closely into the gloom where the girl had vanished. His friend repeated his injunction, and a moment later the two had emerged upon the high road with the village lights in sight beyond, and the forest left behind them like a vast mantle that held the night within its folds. For some minutes neither of them spoke. Then the big man waited for his friend to draw up alongside. About all this valley of the Jura, he said presently, there seems to me something rather weird. He shifted his knapsack vigorously on his back. It was a gesture of unconscious protest. Something uncanny, he added, 
as he set a good pace. But extraordinarily beautiful. It attracts you more than it does me, I think, was the short reply. The picturesque superstitions still survive here, observed the older man. I touched the imagination in spite of oneself. A pause followed during which the other tried to increase the pace. The subject evidently made him impatient for some reason. Perhaps, he said presently. Though I think myself it's due to the curious loneliness of the place. I mean, we're in the middle of tourist Europe here, yet so utterly remote. It's such a neglected little corner of the world. The contradiction bewilders. Then, being so near the frontier too, with the clock changing an hour a mile from the village, makes one think of time as unreal and imaginary. He laughed. He produced several other reasons as well. His friend admitted their value and agreed half-heartedly. He still turned occasionally to look back. The mountain ridge where they had climbed was clearly visible in the moonlight. Odd, he said. But I don't see that farmhouse where we got the milk anywhere. It ought to be easily visible from here. Hardly in this light. It was a queer place, rather, I thought. He added. He did not deny the curiously suggestive atmosphere of the region. He merely wanted to find satisfactory explanations. A case in point, I mean. I didn't like it quite, that farmhouse. Yet I'm hanged if I know why. It made me feel uncomfortable. That girl appeared so suddenly, although the place seemed deserted. And her silence was so odd. Why in the world couldn't she share a single question? I'm glad I didn't take the milk. I spat it out. I'd like to know where she's got it from. For there was no sign of a cow or a goat to be seen anywhere. I swallowed mine in spite of the taste, said the other, half smiling at his companion's sudden volubility. Very abruptly, then, the big man turned and faced his friend. Was it merely an effect of the moonlight, or had his skin really turned pale beneath the sunburn? I say, old man he said, his face grave and serious. What do you think she was? What made her seem like that? And why the devil does you think she followed us? I think, was the slow reply. It was me she was following. The words, and particularly the tone of conviction in which they were spoken, clearly were displeasing to the big man, who already regretted having spoken so frankly what was in his mind. With a companion so imaginative, so impressionable, so nervous, it had been foolish and unwise. He led the way home at a pace that made the other arrive five minutes in his rear, panting, limping, and perspiring as if he had been running. I'm rather for going on into Switzerland tomorrow or the next day, he ventured that night in the darkness of their two-bedded room. I think we've had enough of this place, eh? What do you think? But there was no answer from the bed across the room, for its occupant was sound asleep and snoring. Dead tired, I suppose, he muttered to himself, and then turned over to follow his friend's example. But for a long time sleep refused him. Queer, unwelcome thoughts and feelings kept him awake, of a kind he rarely knew and thoroughly disliked. It was rubbish, yet it made him uncomfortable so that his nerves tingled. He tossed about in the bed. I'm overtired, he persuaded himself. That's all. The strange feelings that kept him thus awake were not easy to analyze, perhaps, but their origin was beyond all question. They grouped themselves about the picture of that deserted, tumbled-down chalet on the mountain ridge where they had stopped for refreshment a few hours before. It was a farmhouse, dilapidated and dirty, and the name stood in big black letters against the blue background on the wall above the door. La Chenille. Yet not a living soul was seen to be seen anywhere about it. The doors were fastened, windows shuttered, chimneys smokeless, dirt, neglect, and decay everywhere in evidence. Then, suddenly, as they had turned to go, after much vain shouting and knocking at the door, a face appeared for an instant at a window, the shutter of which was half open. His friend saw it first and called aloud. The face nodded in reply and presently a young girl came around the corner of the house. 
apparently by a back door, and stood staring at them both from a little distance. And from that very instance, so far as he could remember, these queer feelings had entered his heart. Fear, distrust, misgiving. The thought of it now as he lay in bed in the darkness made his hair rise. There was something about that girl that struck cold into the soul. Yet she was a mere slip of a thing, very pretty, seductive even, with a certain serpent-like fascination about her eyes and movements. And although she only replied to their questions as to refreshment with a smile, uttering no single word, she managed to convey the impression that she was a managing little person who might make herself very disagreeable if she chose. In spite of her undeniable charm, there was about her an atmosphere of something sinister. He himself did most of the questioning, but it was his older friend who had the benefit of her smile. Her eyes hardly ever left his face, and once she had slipped quite close to him and touched his arm. The strange part of it now seemed to him that he could not remember in the least how she was dressed, or what was the coloring of her eyes and hair. It was almost as though he had felt rather than seen her presence. The milk. She produced a jug and two wooden bowls after a brief disappearance round the corner of the house. Was, well... It tasted so odd that he had been unable to swallow it and had spat it out. His friend, on the other hand, savage with thirst, had drunk his bowl to the last drop, too quickly to taste it even, and while he drank, had kept his eyes fixed on those of the girl who stood close in front of him. And from that moment, his friend had somehow changed. On the way down, he said things that were unusual, talking chiefly about the chenille and the girl and the delicious delicate flavor of the milk, yet all phrased in such a way that it sounded singular, unfamiliar, unpleasant even. Now that he tried to recall the sentences, the actual words evaded him, but the memory of the uneasiness and apprehension they caused him to feel remained, and night ever italicizes such memories. Then, to cap it all, the girl had followed them. It was wholly foolish and absurd to feel the things he did feel. Yet there the feelings were, and what was the good of arguing? That girl frightened him. The change in his friend was in some way or other a danger signal. More than this he could not tell. An explanation might come later, but for the present his chief desire was to get away from the place and to get his friend away too. And on this thought, sleep overtook him. Heavily. The windows were wide open. Outside was a garden with a rather high enclosing wall, and at the far end a gate that was locked up, because it led into private fields and so by a back way to the cemetery and the little church. When it was open, the guests of the inn made use of it and got lost in the network of fields and vines, for there was no proper route that way to the road or the mountains. They usually ended up prematurely in the cemetery and got back to the village by passing through the church, which was always open or by knocking at the kitchen doors of the other houses and explaining their position. Hence the gate was locked now to save trouble. After several hours of hot, unrefreshing sleep, the big man turned in his bed and awoke. He tried to stretch, but couldn't, then sat up panting with a sense of suffocation, and by the faint starlight of the summer night he saw next that his friend was up and moving about the room. Remembering that sometimes he walked in his sleep, he called to him gently. Morton, old chap, he said in a low voice, with a touch of authority in it. Go back to bed. You've walked enough for one day. And the figure, obeying as sleepwalkers often will, passed across the room and disappeared among the shadows over his bed. The other plunged and burrowed himself into a comfortable position again for sleep. But the heat of the room, the shortness of the bed and this tiresome interruption of his slumbers made it difficult to lose consciousness. He forced his eyes to keep shut and his body to cease from fidgeting, but there was something nibbling at his mind like a spirit mouse that never permitted him to cross the frontier into actual oblivion. He slept with one eye open, as the saying is, odors of hay and flowers and baked ground stole in through the open window, but them too came from time to time sounds little sounds that disturbed him without being ever loud enough to claim definite attention. Perhaps, after all, he did lose consciousness for a moment, when, 
Suddenly, a thought came with a sharp rush into his mind and galvanized him once more into utter wakefulness. It amazed him that he had not grasped it before. It was this. The figure he had seen was not the figure of his friend. Alarm gripped him at once before he could think or argue, and a cold perspiration broke out all over his body. He fumbled for matches, couldn't find them. Then, remembering there was electric light, he scraped the wall with his fingers and turned on the little white switch. In the sudden glare that filled the room, he saw instantly that his friend's bed was no longer occupied. And his mind, then acting instinctively without process of conscious reasoning, flew like a flash to their walk of the day, to the tumble-down chenille, the glass of milk, the odd behavior of his friend, and to the girl. At the same time, he noticed that the odor in the room, which hitherto had been taken to be the composite odor of fields, flowers, and night, was really something else. It was the odor of freshly turned earth. Immediately on the top of this discovery came another. Those slight sounds he had heard outside the window were not ordinary night sounds. The murmur of wind and insects. They were footsteps moving softly, stealthily down the little paths of crushed granite. He was dressed in wonderful short order, noticing as he did, so that his friend's night garments lay upon the bed, and that he too had therefore dressed. Further, that the door had been unlocked and stood half an inch ajar. There was no question now that he had slept again. Between the present and the moment when he had seen the figure, there had been a considerable interval. A couple minutes later, he had made his way cautiously downstairs and was standing on the garden path in the moonlight. And as he stood there, his mind filled with the stories the proprietor told him a few days before of the superstitions that still lived in the popular imagination and haunted this little, remote, pine-clad valley. The thought of that girl sickened him. The odor of the newly turned earth remained in his nostrils and made his gorge rise. Utterly and vigorously, he rejected the monstrous fictions he had heard. Yet for all that could not prevent their touching his imagination as he stood there in the early hours of the morning, alone with night and silence. The spell was undeniable. Only a wind without sensibility could have ignored it. He searched the little garden from end to end. Empty. Opposite the high gate, he stopped, peering through the iron bars, wet with dew to his hands. Far across the intervening fields, he fancied something moved. A second later, he was sure of it. Something down there to the right beyond the trees was astir. It was in the cemetery. And this definite discovery sent a shudder of terror and disgust through him from head to foot. He framed the name of his friend with his lips, yet the sound did not come forth. Some deeper instinct warned him to hold it back. Instead, after incredible efforts, he climbed that iron gate and dropped down into the soaking grass upon the other side. Then, taking advantage of all the cover he could find, he ran swiftly and stealthily towards the cemetery. On the way, without quite knowing why he did so, he picked up a heavy stick, and a moment later he stood beside the low wall that separated the fields from the churchyard, stood and stared. There, beside the tombstones, with their hideous metal wreaths and crowns of faded flowers, he made out the figure of his friend. He was stooping, crouched down upon the ground. Behind him rose a couple of bushy yew trees, against the dark of which his form was easily visible. He was not alone. In front of him, bending close over him, it seemed, was another figure. A slight, shadowy, slim figure. This time the big man found his voice and called aloud. Morton! Morton! he cried. What in the name of heaven are you doing? What's the matter? And the instant his deep voice broke the stillness of the night with its clamor, the little figure, half hiding his friend, turned about and faced him. He saw a white face with shining eyes and teeth as the form rose. The moonlight painted it with its own strange pallor. It was weird, unreal, horrible. And across the mouth, downwards from the lips of the chin, ran a deep stain of crimson. The next moment, the figure slid with a queer gliding motion towards the trees and disappeared among the yews and tombstones in the direction of the church. The heavy stick, hurled whirling after it, fell harmlessly halfway, knocking a metal cross from its perch upon an upright grave. 
and the man who had thrown it raced full speed towards the huddled-up figure of his friend hardly noticing the thin, wailing cry that rose trembling through the night air from the vanished form. Nor did he notice more particularly that several of the graves newly made showed signs of recent disturbance, and that the odor of turned earth he had noticed in the room grew stronger. All his attention was concentrated upon the figure at his feet. Morton, man, get up. Wake, for God's sake. You've been walking in... Then the words died upon his lips. The unnatural attitude of his friend's shoulders and the way the head dropped back to show the neck struck him like a blow in the face. There was no sign of movement. He lifted the body up and carried it, all limp and unresisting, by ways he never remembered afterwards, back to the inn. It was all a dreadful nightmare, a nightmare that carried over its ghastly horror into waking life. He knew that the proprietor and his wife moved busily to and fro about the bed and that in due course the village doctor was upon the scene, and that he was giving a muddled and feverish description of all he knew, telling how his friend was a confirmed sleepwalker and all the rest. But he did not realize the truth until he saw the face of the doctor as he straightened up from the long examination. Will you wake him? He heard himself asking, or let him sleep it out till morning. And the doctor's expression, even before the reply came to confirm it, told him the truth. Ah, monsieur, your friend will never wake again, I fear. It is the heart, you see. Alas, the sudden failure of the heart. The final scenes in the little tragedy which thus brought his holiday to so abrupt and terrible a close need no description, being in no way essential to this strange story. There were one or two curious details, however, that came to light afterwards. One was that for some weeks before there had been signs of disturbance among newly made graves in the cemetery, which the authorities had been trying to trace to the nightly wanderings of the village madman. In vain. And another, that the morning after the death the trail of blood had been found across the church floor, as though someone had passed through from the back entrance to the front. A special service was held that very week to cleanse the holy building from the evil of that stain, for the villagers, deep in their superstitions, declared that nothing human had left that trail. Nothing could have made those marks but a vampire disturbed at midnight in its awful occupation among the dead. Apart from such idle rumors, however, the bereaved carried with him to this day certain other remarkable details which cannot be so easily dismissed for he had a brief conversation with the doctor, it appears, that impressed him profoundly. And the doctor, an intelligent man, prosaic as granite into the bargain, had questioned him rather closely as to the recent life and habits of his dead friend. The account of their climb to the chenille he heard with amazement he could not conceal. But no such chalet exists, he said. There is no chenille a long time ago, fifty years or more, there was such a place, but it was destroyed by the authorities on account of the evil reputation of the people who lived there. They burnt it. Nothing remains today but a few bits of broken wall and foundation. Evil reputation? The doctor shrugged his shoulders. Travelers, even peasants, disappeared, he said. An old woman lived there with her daughter, and poisoned milk was supposed to be used but the neighborhood accused them of worse than ordinary murder. In what way? Said the girl was a vampire, answered the doctor shortly. And after a moment's hesitation, he added, turning his face away as he spoke. It was a curious thing, though, that tiny hole in your friend's throat, small as a pinprick yet so deep, and the heart, did I tell you? was almost completely drained of blood. The End The Sumac How red that sumac is! Irene Barton murmured something commonplace, for to her the tree brought painful recollections. Her visitor, unconscious of this fact, proceeded to elaborate. Do you know, Irene, that tree gives me the creeps. I can't explain, except that it is not a nice tree, not a good tree. For instance, 
Why should its leaves be red in August when they are not supposed to turn until October? What queer ideas you have, May. The tree is right enough, although its significance to me is sad. Poor Spot, you know. We buried him beneath it two days ago. Come and see his grave. The two women left the terrace, where this conversation had been taking place, and leisurely strolled across the lawn, at the end of which, in almost startling isolation, grew the sumac. At least Mrs. Watcomb, who evinced so great an interest in the tree, questioned whether it actually was a sumac, for the foliage was unusual and the branches gnarled and twisted beyond recognition. Just now the leaves were stained with splashes of dull crimson, but rather than droop they had a bloated appearance, as if the luxuriance of the growth were not altogether healthy. For several moments they stood regarding the pathetic little grave, and the silence was only broken when Mrs. Watcomb darted beneath the tree and came back with something in her hand. Irene, look at this dead thrush. Poor little thing. Such splendid plumage, yet it hardly weighs a sugar plum. Mrs. Barton regarded it with wrinkled brows. I cannot understand what happens to the birds, May, unless someone lays poison. We continually find them dead about the garden, and usually beneath or very near this tree. It is doubtful whether Mrs. Watcomb listened. Her attention seemed to wander that morning, and she was studying the twisted branches of the sumac with a thoughtful scrutiny. Curious that the leaves should turn at this time of year, she murmured. It brings to mind poor Geraldine's illness. This tree had an extraordinary fascination for her, you know was quite scarlet then, and yet it was only June. It had barely finished shooting. My dear May, you have red leaves on the brain this morning, Irene retorted, uncertain whether to be irritated or amused. I can't think why you are so concerned about the color. It is only the result of two days' excessive heat, for scarcely a leaf was touched when I buried poor old Spot. The conversation seemed absurdly trivial. Yet, Mrs. Watcomb gone, Irene could not help her mind from dwelling on her cousin's fatal illness. The news had reached them with the shock of the absolutely unexpected. Poor Geraldine, who had always been so strong to have fallen victim to acute anemia. It was almost unbelievable that heart failure should have put an anemia end to her sweet young life. And after a few days ailing... Of course, the sad event had wrought a wonderful change for Irene and her husband, giving them, in place of a cramped suburban villa, this beautiful country home, Cleve Grange. Everything for her was filled with the delight of novelty, for she had ruled as mistress over the charmed abode for only one short week. Hilary, her husband, was yet a stranger to the more intimate of its attractions, being detained in London by the winding up of business affairs. Several days elapsed, for the most part given solely to the keen pleasure of arranging and rearranging the new home. As time went by, the crimson splashes on the sumac faded, the leaves becoming green again, though drooping as if from want of moisture. Irene noticed this when she paid her daily visits to the pathetic little dog grave, trying to induce flowers to take root upon it. But do what she might, they invariably faded. Nothing, not even grass, would grow beneath the sumac. Only death seemed to thrive there, she mused in a fleeting moment of depression as she searched around for more dead birds. But none had fallen since the thrush, picked up by Mrs. Watcomb. One evening, the heat inside the house was becoming insupportable. Irene wandered into the garden, her steps mechanically leading her to the little grave beneath the sumac. In the uncertain moonlight, the twisted trunk and branches of the old tree were suggestive of a rustic seat, and feeling tired, she lifted herself into the natural bower, and lolled back, joyously inhaling the cool night air. Presently, she dropped asleep, and in a curiously vivid manner dreamt of Hillary, that he had completed his business in London and was coming home. They met at evening near the garden gate, and Hillary spread wide his arms and eagerly folded them about her. Swiftly, the dream began to change, assuming the characteristic of a nightmare. The sky grew strangely dark, 
the arms fiercely masterful, while the face which bent to kiss her neck was not that of her young husband. It was leering, wicked, gnarled-like, like the trunk of some weathered, beaten tree. Chilled with horror, Irene fought long and desperately against the vision, to be at last awakened by her own frightened whimpering. Yet returning consciousness did not immediately dissipate the nightmare. In imagination, she was still held rigid by brutal arms, and it was only after a blind, half-waking struggle that she freed herself and went speeding across the lawn towards the lighted doorway. Next morning, Mrs. Watcombe called and subjected her to a puzzled scrutiny. How pale you look, Irene. Do you feel ill? Ill? No, only a little languid. I find this hot weather very tiring. Mrs. Watcombe studied her with care, for the pallor of Irene's face was very marked. In contrast, a vivid spot of red showed on the slender neck, an inch or so below the ear. Intuitively, a hand went up as Irene turned to her friend in explanation. It feels so sore. I think I must have grazed the skin last night while sitting in the sumac. Sitting in the sumac? echoed Mrs. Watcombe in surprise. How curious you should do that. Poor Geraldine used to do the same just before she was taken ill. And yet at last she was seized with a perfect horror of the tree. Goodness but it is quite red again this morning. Irene swung round in the direction of the tree, filled with a vague repugnance. Sure enough, the leaves no longer drooped, nor were they green. They had become flecked once more with crimson, and the growth had quite regained its former vigor. Ugh, she breathed, hurriedly turning towards the house. It reminds me of a horrid nightmare. I have rather a head this morning. Let's go in and talk of something else. As the day advanced, the heat grew more oppressive, and night brought with it a curious stillness, the stillness which so often presages a heavy thunderstorm. No bird had offered up its evening hymn, no breeze came sufficient to stir a single leaf. Everything was pervaded by the silence of expectancy. The interval between dinner and bedtime is always a dreary one for those accustomed to companionship and left all alone, Irene's restlessness momentarily increased. First the ceiling, then the very atmosphere seemed to weigh heavy upon her head. Although windows and doors were all flung wide, the airlessness of the house grew less and less endurable, until from sheer desperation she made her escape into the garden, where a sudden illumination of the horizon gave warning of the approaching storm. Feeling somewhat at a loss, she roamed aimlessly a while, pausing sometimes to catch the echoes of distant thunder, until at last she found herself standing over Spot's desolate little grave. The sight struck her with a sense of utter loneliness, and the tears sprang to her eyes, in poignant longing for the companionship of her faithful pet. Moved by she knew not what, Irene swung herself into the comfortable branches of the old sumac, and soothed by the reposeful attitude, her head soon began to nod and slumber. Afterwards, it was a doubtful memory whether she actually did sleep or whether the whole experience was not a kind of waking nightmare. Something of the previous evening's dream returned to her, but this time with added horror, for it commenced with no pleasurable vision of her husband. Instead, relentless, stick-like arms immediately closed in upon her their vice-like grip so tight that she could scarcely breathe. Down darted the awful head, rugged and lined by every sin, darting at the fair white neck as a wild beast on its prey. The foul lips began to eat into her skin. She struggled desperately, madly, for to her swooning sentence the very branches of the tree became endowed with active life, coiling unmercifully around her, tenaciously clinging to her limbs and tearing at her dress. Pain at last spurred her to an heroic effort, the pain of something, perhaps a twig, digging deep into her unprotected neck. With a choking cry, she freed herself and, nerved by a sudden burst of thunder, ran tottering towards the shelter of the house. Having gained the cozy lounge hall, Irene sank into an armchair, gasping hysterically for breath. Gusts of refreshing wind came through the open windows, 
But although the atmosphere rapidly grew less stagnant, an hour passed before she could make sufficient effort to crawl upstairs to bed. In her room, a further shock awaited her. The bloodless, drawn face reflected in the mirror was scarcely recognizable. The eyes lacked luster, the lips were white, the skin hung flabby on the shrunken flesh, giving it a look of a premature old age. A tiny trickle of dried blood, a solitary smudge of color stained the chalky pallor of her neck. Taking up a hand glass, she examined this with momentary concern. It was the old wound, reopened, an angry-looking sore, almost like the bite of some small or very sharp toothed animal. It smarted painfully. Mrs. Watcomb, bursting into the breakfast room next morning with suggestions of an expedition to the neighboring town, was shocked at Irene's looks and insisted on going at once to fetch the doctor. Mrs. Watcomb fussed continually throughout the interview and insisted on an examination of the scar upon Irene's neck. Patient and doctor had regarded this as a negligible detail but finally the latter subjected it to a slightly puzzled scrutiny, advising that it should be kept bandaged. He suggested that Irene was suffering from anemia and would do well to keep as quiet as possible, building up her strength with food, open windows, and a general selection of pills and tonics. But despite these comforting arrangements, no one was entirely satisfied. The doctor lacked something in assurance. Irene was certain that she could not really be anemic while Mrs. Watcomb was obsessed by inward misgivings, perfectly indefinable, yet nonetheless disturbing. She left the house as a woman bent under a load of care. Passing up the lane, her glance lighted on the old sumac, more crimson now, more flourishing in its growth than she had seen it since the time of Geraldine's fatal illness. I loathe that horrid old tree, she murmured, then added, struck by a nameless premonition. Her husband ought to know. I shall wire to him at once. Irene, womanlike, put to use her enforced idleness by instituting a rearrangement of the box room, the only part of her new home which yet remained unexplored. Among the odds and ends of the rubbish to be thrown away, there was a little notebook, apparently unused. In idle curiosity, Irene picked it up and was surprised to learn from an inscription that her cousin Geraldine had intended to use it as a diary. A date appeared, only a few days prior to the poor girl's death, but no entries had been made, though the first two pages of the book had certainly been removed. As Irene put it down, there flooded to the ground a torn scrap of writing. She stooped and continued stooping, breathlessly staring at the words that had been written by her cousin's hand. Sumac fascinates me. In some unaccountable manner, this applied to her. It was obvious what tree was meant, the old sumac at the end of the lawn, and it fascinated her, Irene, though not until that moment she had openly recognized the fact. Searching hurriedly through the notebook, she discovered near the end a heap of torn paper, evidently the first two pages of a diary. She turned the pieces in eager haste. Most of them bore no more than one short word or portions of a longer one but a few bigger fragments proved more enlightening, and filled with nervous apprehension, she carried the book to her escritoire and spent the remainder of the afternoon in trying to piece together the torn-up pages. Meanwhile, Mrs. Watcomb was worrying and fretting over Irene's unexpected illness. Her pallor, her listlessness, even the curious mark upon her neck gave cause for positive alarm. So exactly did they correspond with symptoms exhibited by her cousin Geraldine during the few days prior to her death. She wished that the village doctor, who had attended the earlier case, would return soon from his holiday, as his locum tenens seemed sadly wanting in that authoritative decision which is so consoling to patients, relatives, and friends. Feeling as an old friend responsible for the welfare of Irene, she wired to Hillary, telling him of the sudden illness and advising him to return without delay. The urgency of the telegram alarmed him, so much so that he left London by the next train, arriving at Cleve Grange shortly after dark. Where is your mistress? was his first inquiry, as the maid met him in the hall. Upstairs, sir. She complained of feeling tired and said she would go to bed. He hurried to her room, only to find it empty. He called, 
He rang for the servants. In a moment the whole house was astir, yet nowhere was Irene to be found. Deeming it possible that she might have gone to see Mrs. Watcombe, Hillary was about to follow, when that lady herself was ushered in. I saw the lights of your cab, she commenced, cutting short the sentence as she met his questioning glance. Where is Irene? Irene? My dear Hillary, is she not here? No, we can't find her anywhere. I thought she might have been with you. For the space of half a second, Mrs. Watcombe's face presented a picture of astonishment. Then the expression changed to one of dismayed concern. She is in that tree. I'm certain of it. Hillary, we must fetch her in at once. Completely at a loss to understand, he followed the excited woman into the garden, stumbling blindly in her wake across the lawn. The darkness was intense, and a terrific wind beat them back as if with living hands. Irene's white dress at length became discernible, dimly thrown up against the pitchy background and obscured in places by the twists and coils of the old sumac. Between them, they grasped the sleeping body, but the branches swung wildly in the gale, and to Hillary's confused imagination, it was as if they had literally to tear it from the tree's embrace. At last, they regained the shelter of the house and laid their inanimate burden on the sofa. She was quite unconscious, pale as death, and her face painfully contorted, as if with fear. The old wound on the neck, now bereft of bandages, had been reopened and was wet with blood. Hillary rushed off to fetch the doctor while Mrs. Watcombe and the servants carried Irene to her room. Several hours passed before she recovered consciousness, and during that time Hillary was gently but firmly excluded from the sick room. Bewildered and disconsolate, he wandered restlessly about the house until his attention was arrested by the unusual array of torn-up bits of paper on Irene's desk. He saw that she had been sorting out the pieces and sticking them together as the sentences became complete. The work was barely half-finished, yet what was there to read struck him as exceedingly strange. The seat in the old sumac fascinates me. I find myself going back to it unconsciously, nay, even against my will. Oh, but the nightmare visions it always brings me. In them I seem to plumb the very depths of terror. Their memory preys upon my mind, and every day my strength grows less. Dr. H. speaks of anemia. That was as far as Irene had proceeded. Hardly knowing what he did so, Hillary resolved to complete the task, but the chill of early morning was in the air before it was finished. Cramped and stiff, he was pushing back his chair when a footstep sounded in the doorway and Mrs. Watcombe entered. Irene is better, she volunteered immediately. She is sleeping naturally, and Dr. Thompson says there is no longer any immediate danger. The poor child is terribly weak and bloodless. May, tell me, what is the meaning of all this? Why has Irene suddenly become so ill? I can't understand it. Mrs. Watcombe's face was preternaturally grave. Even the doctor admits that he is puzzled, she answered very quietly. The symptoms all point to a sudden and excessive loss of blood, though in cases of acute anemia. God, but not like Geraldine. I can't believe it. Neither can I. Oh, Hillary, you may think me mad, but I can't help feeling there is some unknown, some awful influence at work. Irene was perfectly well three days ago and it was the same with Geraldine before she was taken ill. The cases are so exactly similar, Irene was trying to tell me something about a diary, but the poor girl was too exhausted to make herself properly understood. Diary? Geraldine's diary, do you think? She must mean that. I've just finished piecing it together, but frankly I can't make head or tail of it. Mrs. Watcombe, rapidly scanning the writing, then studied it again with greater care. Finally, she read the second part aloud. Listen, Hillary, this seems to me important. Dr. H. speaks of anemia. Pray heaven he may be correct, for my thoughts sometimes move in a direction which foreshadows nothing short of lunacy, or so people would tell me, if I could bring myself to confide these things. I must fight alone, clinging to the knowledge that it is usual for anemic patients to be obsessed by unhealthy fancies. If only I had not read those horrible suggestive words in Barrett. Barrett? What can she mean, May? Wait a moment. Barrett. Barrett's traditions of the county, perhaps? 
I've noticed a copy in the library. Let us go there. It may give the clue. The book was quickly found, and a marker indicated the passage to which Geraldine apparently referred. At Cleve, I was reminded of another of those traditions so rapidly disappearing before the spread of education. It concerned the old belief in vampires, spirits of the evil dead, who by night could assume a human form and scour the countryside in search of victims. Suspected vampires, if caught, were buried with the mouth stuffed full of garlic and a stake plunged through the heart, whereby they were rendered harmless or at least confined to that one particular locality. Some thirty years ago, an old man pointed out a tree which was said to have grown from such a stake. So far as I can recollect, it was an unusual variety of sumac and had been enclosed during a recent extension to the garden of the old grange. Come outside, said Mrs. Watcombe, breaking a long and solemn silence. I want you to see that tree. The sky was suffused with the blush of early dawn and the shrubs, the flowers, even the dew upon the grass caught and reflected something in the pink effulgence. The sumac alone stood out, dark and menacing. During the night, its leaves had become a hideous, mottled purple. Its growth was oily, bloated, unnaturally vigorous, like that of some rank and poisonous weed. Mrs. Watcomb, looking from afar, spoke in frightened, husky tones. See, Hillary? It was exactly like that when... When Geraldine died. When evening fell, the end of the lawn was strangely bare. In place of the old tree, there lay an enormous heap of smoldering embers. Enormous, because the sumac had been too sodden with dark and sticky sap to burn without the assistance of large quantities of other timber. Many weeks elapsed before Irene was sufficiently recovered to walk as far as Spot's little grave. She was surprised to find it almost hidden in a bed of garlic. Hillary explained that it was the only plant they could induce to grow there. The End